Morning guys, hope you are doing all right after last night. All right, so. So essentially what I'm gonna do is talk about some of the basic imaging that you need to know as a vascular surgeon and why you would order a certain test in relationship to another and particularly with relationship to a non-invasive vascular lab. So it's important to understand that um, not all patients present with symptoms. When you see them in clinic, you may also have to be the physician that says, no, you don't have peripheral arterial disease. Your studies are normal. Your symptoms are from something else. So you need to understand that. And then from your history and presenting symptoms, that can direct you as to what studies that you need to order for your, for your patient so that you're not immediately going to a CAT scan or an angiogram so that you're applying some of the non-invasive studies to your patient. So one for it minimizes cost, but also the risk to the patient with um, complications related to some of the more invasive studies. Um, so patients that do present um, to your clinic may be asymptomatic, um, but they have other comorbidities related to peripheral arterial disease. And then some of them present with atypical leg pain, and it's your job to delineate whether they indeed have peripheral arterial disease or not. So in asymptomatic patients can have peripheral arterial disease. It's just that they don't exert those symptoms because some of them have comorbidities that disallow them to walk or to exercise, and so they don't really have classic claudication symptoms. And then, as you all know, the claudication symptoms are very reproducible. They get the symptoms in their thigh, buttock, lower extremities, or calf muscles um, at a certain fixed point, and then it goes away with exercise. I mean, sorry, it goes away with rest. So common sites, as you know, aorta iliac disease is the buttock, hip, and thigh, femoral branches, and the, and the main artery is the, th the, high, the high thigh, and then the popsial artery, that's really it's the branches around the popsule that um, provide blood supply to the calf muscles. So your job is to differentiate between other symptoms um, and to say, indeed, whether this patient has profiteal disease or not. So the exam, of course, starts with a physical exam. If you, um, and most importantly, take the patient's shoes off and assess for the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial artery, understanding that the perineal artery does not go into the foot. So when do you obtain um, further imaging or further studies, you're, you always need to perform a Doppler exam, and that's just a general expectation. It's like your stethoscope. Doppler exam is, your, your Doppler probe is, is your friend. So patients that need a Doppler exam obviously are patients with absent pulses, non anyone with non-healing wounds, um, and anyone with, um, that's difficult to feel their, their pulses because they have edema or ulcerations or wounds. Um, and always apply the Doppler with a 60-degree 60, 60 angle of incination, because if you remember the sine cosine rule, if you're at a 90-degree angle, you're not going to hear it. So an ABI, you should perform an ABI in anyone without pulses, anyone with non-healing wounds, exertional leg symptoms, um, and, and then those patients that are older or patients with diabetes. And the ABI is obtained by, or by measuring the blood pressure in both arms using the highest blood pressure, because typically patients will, if they have significant peripheral disease, may have disease in their subclavian artery on the left-hand side. So that artery, that pressure can oftentimes be normal. So when you do an ABI, you want the highest blood pressure. And then you measure the, the pressure in the posterior tip and dorsalis pedis artery with the Doppler probe, and you use the highest one at the level of the ankle. So in a sense, what you're doing is you, you're providing the lowest level of, of disease that the patient has. I mean, what, so what it is is if your ABI is point eight on, one's on the posterior tib and point two with the dorsalis pedis, you use a point eight. So here's just, oh, that didn't work. But um, essentially what this w w showed was a calculation, um, but for some reason the picture's not working. So ABI gives you a lot of information. Anyone with an ABI less than point nine has by definition peripheral arterial disease. And then for each degree of of stenosis or occlusion, 
you usually get a drop in 0.3. And then the lower the level of the ABI, the, the worse the disease is, as you know. Um, and it correlates with walking distance, velocity balance, overall physical activity. And really, an ABI of point, less than 0.9 is a predictor of finding something on the angiogram. And of course, it relates to all-cause mortality. Mortality rates um, average about 2% with an ABI of less than 0.9. And then also non-fatal MI, stroke, and death related to vascular diseases. So the lower the ABI, the higher the, higher the burden of peripheral arterial disease. So when do you get an ABI after treadmill? This is used for patients who present with claudication symptoms but have a normal ABI at rest. So what you want to do is you want to elicit their symptoms by having them exercise, measure the ABI before the exercise, measure the ABI after the exercise, and what you're really doing is unmasking their symptoms. And essentially, you put, obviously there are some patients that you wouldn't want to put on a treadmill, and that would be someone with exertional angina. That's a good way of knocking them off before you ever do any intervention. Um, so, you, classically, it's, it's one and a half miles per hour, 12% gradients, and you put them on the treadmill, have them walk, they then tell you when they have symptoms, so you measure the time, and then if they are unable to walk, then they stop, and it gives you a good measure of, of, of degree of disease. So a, a normal um, pressure should normalize within two minutes. There should be little or no pressure change at, from baseline. When you have a, a stenosis or occlusion, you get a greater than 20% drop, which should normalize at two to six minutes. So if it takes longer to normalize, that means they have significant disease. So anything over um, six minutes is single level disease, and anything over that can be multiple level disease. So this is a good way of eliciting peripheral arterial disease in patients that have normal ABIs at rest. When do you get a TBI? Well, a TBI is really for patients that have a, a normal ABI. It's not really that they have a normal ABI, it's that they have significant calcification and their vessels are non-compressible. So the ABI that you're achieving with, you know, with the pressure at the ankle isn't realistic. So these are the patients that need a t TBI because that really is a more um, accurate indication of what the disease is into the foot. So anyone with an ABI greater than 1.4, which would mean significant calf suffocation. When the ABI is uncertain, these are maybe people who have combination of arterial and venous disease and you can't put a cuff around the ankle because they have wounds. Or anyone with an uh, ankle pressure greater than 200. And these classically are patients with diabetes or end-stage renal disease. And so an ABI of, uh, sorry, a TBI, Less than 0.7 is abnormal. That's not right. It should be TBI. Um, so then when do you order something more than that, a transcutaneous oxygen level or skin perfusion pressure? We typically order these in patients when we're uncertain of the level at which they would heal an amputation. So if they have bad you know, wounds on their forefoot or they're missing a couple toes and you know that their, their ABIs are falsely elevated, these are the patients that will measure skin perfusion pressure at the level of the forefoot, the ankle, and the mid-calf, and that helps you delineate whether they'll heal an amputation, because what you don't want to do is do a TMA, and then that breaks down, or do a toe amputation, and that never heals. This really gives you an accurate measure of, of healing potential for that. So anyone with a skin perfusion pressure greater than 35 or 40 has a greater than 90% chance of healing. Anyone with a uh, transcutaneous oxygen level of less than 10, they're not going to heal. So you need to either increase the blood supply with an operation or endovascular procedure or make their amputation level higher. Because what you don't want to do is do a toe amputation, a TMA, an ankle um, you know, procedure and then uh, end up you know, five operations later with a baloney amputation. It's not reasonable for the patient. Um, and then duplex ultrasound essentially is a cheap version of an angiogram. It helps you define anatomic location of the stenosis or occlusion. It really provides a, a road map or a map of what the disease is in the lower extremity, and it provides a guide for further imaging. And also we use it for surveillance, officer interventions, um, and then also to guide arterial interventions. It provides, um, or it, obviously it's inexpensive, it's portable, it's reproducible, but the limitations are it is operator dependent. 
So in our institution, we've, you know, my partner was sort of one of the originators of, of the criteria for ultrasound. So we, we have no qualms operating based on the ultrasound in our institution. I wouldn't advise that in your institution if, that, if you don't have an accredited vascular lab. Um, and to be accredited, you have to, con you have to comply with some of the regulations, but importantly, compare your angiographic findings with the ultrasound and make sure that they are indeed accurate. Um, and then obviously an ultrasound isn't good, it doesn't work well for, for th looking at thoracic disease or in patients with morbid obesity. Um, what the ultrasound does provide you is some physiologic information as well as um, anatomic information. From the ultrasound you can get an ABI, you can get your segmental pressures, and then you can look at flow characteristics like peak systolic velocities as well as the, the arterial um, pulse con contours and amplitudes. Um, so this is a, the segmental pressure. As you know, um, you can measure it with three, three pressures or four in our institution. We do four, so high thigh, low thigh, below knee, and ankle. And looking at the differential between the high thigh, low thigh, or the low thigh, below knee, or below knee, ankle, you can delineate whether it's disease. And that would be, um, uh, greater than 20 millimeter of mercury from one level to the other, or a difference between the left side and the right side. So I think here, so high thigh pressure should be greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, higher, th higher than the arm blood pressure. So if your high thigh pressure is lower than the arm pressure or around the same, you know that you have aortic iliac disease. Aortic disease if you have bilateral findings, or iliac disease if you have unilateral findings. And then the above knee and below knee pressure should be um, similar to the highest arm blood pressure. And then, like I mentioned, a, a drop in 30 millimeters of mercury between one level and another is indicative of disease, and then the you know, bilateral versus unilateral. Um, you also get stock, um, and end diastolic velocities. These are the average velocities that you'd find in each of the low um, arteries. And then knowing that um, the pressure the ratio differences would imply disease. So greater than four um, difference in velocity from one level to another would imply that you have a significant narrowing with stenosis greater than 75%. Um, so waveforms at the stenotic level will, be, will show increased velocities, just like if you narrow the lumen of a garden hose, your velocity increases. It's the same with the arteries. Um, and in severe disease, the stock velocity can tend to top off. Um, and so at higher levels, you're not going to get something higher than four or 500. You're just not going to see an eight or 900. Um, and so as you know, triphasic arterial Doppler signals are essentially normal. Biphasic would be one level of disease. Triphasic, multi level of disease. But understanding that monophasic can be abnormal um, with proximal as well as distal obstruction. Um, if the difference between those is one with proximal disease and one is um, with collateral flow. Um, so after you've done non-invasive study, you have to decide whether you're going to get a CTA, uh, MDCT, or an MRA, and that's really institution dependent. In ours, we tend to use CTA. Um, at the VA, they tend to use more MRAs, um, and each of them have their own um, component advantages and disadvantages, and I'm sure all of you know them, but very briefly, the advantages of CDA, a CTA is, is it's rapid, but the limitations, of course, are that you have to provide contrast to the patient, and there are complications related to that, and really be mindful of patients with allergies to contrast. Um, a multi-detector CT um, really provides us more information in the sense that you can get three-dimensional imaging, um, and you can... Um, um, and you can, um, you know, from your, your 3D reconstructions, you really use that like a, you know, an angiogram and never have to perform a digital subtraction angiogram. But there, of course, the limitations are it, it is nephrotoxic and lack of dynamic information. The MRA, however, <coughs> does have the advantage in, in that it does provide some dynamic information and you don't have the same inherent um, complications relate to contrast, but there is a subgroup of patients that can have complications relate to the contrast, and these are patients with an acute change in their GFR or 
highest risk is in those with GFR less than 30. And of course, claustrophobia is a, pro is a problem in some of the patients. And then finally, your DSA, um, it's sort of your gold standard, which, which all studies are compared to, but there, it is invasive and there are complications related to this. So that's it in a nutshell. Any questions related to non-invasive studies? I think everyone knows sort of the basic um, CT, MRA, digital subtraction, and geography. All right. Sorry, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Let me ask you a quick question. Do you, is uh, TCPO2 as part of your, I mean, do you guys routinely do it or yeah. just when? You we use it a lot. Use it a lot. Yeah. Especially if we, if, you know, if you don't want to get an angiogram and someone that you know has, mm -hmm. you know, um, multivessel disease based on prior studies, but also in someone who might have, um, you know, palpable, uh, I mean, we use it a lot. I mean, it's part of our armamentarian and delineated whether, whether we're going to do a TMA or something higher. All right. All right. Thanks, Eric.